We have a nice example here of Tetralogy of Fallow, albeit with a somewhat hypoplastic outlet septum. But if we look at the specimen, and as you see, we are looking at it from the apex of the right ventricle, so here is the tricuspid valve, we see very nicely the salient features of the malformation. This structure is the septomarginal trabeculation, or the septal band. And you see that the interventricular communication is between the limbs of the septomarginal trabeculation. And this specimen shows very nicely the salient feature of tetralogy, which is the anterocephalad deviation of this structure, the muscular outlet septum, separating the subpulmonary and the subaortic outflow tract, and the septal attachment of the outlet septum is to the anterocephalad limb of the septomarginal trabeculation. There is then malalignment between the outlet septum and the plane of the ventricular septum, which is reinforced by the septal band or the septomarginal trabeculation. And as you see, the parietal attachment of the outlet septum is to the anterior wall of the right ventricle. And then if we rotate the specimen so that we can look up the subpulmonary infundibulum, which has been attacked during life in an attempt to relieve the subpulmonary stenosis, we see that the obstruction is produced by a squeeze between the deviated outlet septum and these hypertrophied septoparietal trabeculations, which run down as a series of trabeculations from the anterior margin of the septomarginal trabeculation. Now as we look up the outflow tract of the right ventricle towards the ventricular base, we see very nicely that a good half of the aortic valve is attached within the right ventricle, specifically to this structure, which is the ventricular infundibular fold, separating the leaflets of the tricuspid valve from the leaflets of the aortic valve. And this is the inner heart curvature. If we go through here, we go to the rightward margin of the transverse sinus, where we would find the branches of the right coronary artery. And this specimen shows us very nicely the morphology of the interventricular communication, which is seen most frequently in the setting of Tetralogy of Fallow. Because as you see, the ventriculo infundibular fold separating the leaflet of the tricuspid from the leaflet of the aortic valve stops short here in the posterior inferior margin of the interventricular communication so that we see fibrous continuity at this point between the leaflets of the aortic valve and the leaflet of the tricuspid valve. And here there is a small fold which is the remnant of the interventricular membranous septum or the so-called membranous flap. And it is this fibrous continuity between the leaflets of the aortic valve and the tricuspid valve that tell us that this particular ventricular septal defect is perimembranous. Now when we define the margins of the ventricular septal defect, we do so by looking from the right ventricle so you see that the posterior inferior rim is the area of fibrous continuity, reinforced by the membranous flap. Then we find the posterior caudal limb of the septomarginal trabeculation, the anterocephalad limb of the septomarginal trabeculation, the outlet septum, the parietal attachment of the outlet septum, and then the ventriculo infundibular fold. And the major danger area, of course, is thus this posterior inferior margin where the conduction axis penetrates through the area and central fibrous body where there is fibrous continuity between the leaflets of the aortic valve, the tricuspid valve, the right bundle branch emerging here beneath the medial papillary muscle. And the landmark for the conduction axis is a line drawn from the apex of the triangle of Koch at this point to the medial papillary muscle so that this is the area of the interventricular communication that is most at risk during surgical repair.